there's so many things he sets me free from like every day. Like I find something new every day that I'm free to do or free to discover. You know, free from generational sin, free from, you know, shame. I'm free to grieve, you know. I'm free from feeling unloved. And I, I don't need anyone to, like Christ tells me I'm free. And I just receive that and I just believe that. I can never be convinced otherwise. Yeah, I just, I have found like freedom in numbers, you know, freedom in, in celebration, freedom in expression, freedom in, um, in testimony. So those have been the things that have really you know, allowed me to step into you know, the new life that, that he promised me that I read about, you know, and I was told about. What freedom means for me, it represents change, it represents newness, it represents life and growth represents transformation, restoration. I even feel grateful for the bondage that I had because now I kind of know what it's like. I know how valuable this freedom really, really is. I'm free to celebrate where I'm at. I'm free to embrace, declare, and just express loudly and, and testify to the fact that I'm free, that these were my brokennesses and, and now they've been, you know, I've been healed from them. I don't ever want to stand still again. Christ just keeps bringing me forward and bringing me forward and he shows me new freedoms every day. It's exciting, I identify with that. And that's why I'm here. Christ has set me free. Come on, let's give it up for John. Yeah. That's the theme for this month, freedom. For Christ has set us free. Uh, we're going to start this series of the summer letters written to uh, the churches of Galatia. We're going to get into that in just a moment. Just so glad that you're here. Welcome everybody that's watching on our online campus today. It's just so good to be together. Um, but before I get started, uh, I want to show you a, a few photos. Our team got back last night, as Pastor Fi mentioned, got back from Open Arms down in Camelou, Mexico. And they had a great time. Um, God was faithful to get them across the border and back into the United States. Isn't that great? But uh, they had just a wonderful time there doing some ministry, uh, both to children, uh, doing vacation Bible school. Come on, vacation Bible school. And uh, also bringing a potable water to the, the residents of the community in Camelou and La Mission. And then also being able to distribute food. And then we had a team that uh, was putting a roof on a brand new church and a brand new campus, Los Pinos, that's just about to open uh, in a few short months. Um, they're putting up four buildings. And they, 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 they push through some heat. Usually down there, from what I understand, uh, it's kind of temperate like around the Bay Area, San Diego, but they had kind of a hot spell. So they pushed through that. They got that roof on the church for that new campus, and soon it'll be open and people will be worshiping. They did a Friday night service for youth and uh, had a hot dog feed, and it was just great. It was awesome. So I'm going to tell you that it all made possible. Yes, God did it, but Pastor Gwen took the mantle. She led that beginning to end and did a fantastic job. Would you just give it up for Pastor Gwen this morning? Yeah. It was awesome. So this morning, we're, we're getting ready to dive into this book of Galatians. In this theory, uh, we, we thought it would be good to start it on the 4th of July, 4th of July weekend, because we're celebrating freedom in America. And one of the things that I've learned about freedom in, in my years of life is that freedom is both precious and it is precarious. It is precious and it is precarious. There's no other republic that I can think of in the history of mankind that uh, has lasted as long with the freedoms that we have as the United States of America. But there's always been this need to deal with forces from without and forces from within that would seek to destroy and take away that freedom. And as we look at the book of Galatians, we find the same thing is true. For freedom, Christ has set you free. And yet, just like in the Republic of the United States, there are forces, as we try to follow Christ, there are forces from the outside and forces from within that seek to take away those freedoms. 
And so we're going to be doing this study, and I believe that there's going to be some nuggets that we're going to produce, and you're going to really mine some truth out of this, but there's also going to be some things that you discover as you go through it. And I pray that you just read through this book, because basically, this is a book, and if you just want to kind of get the 30,000-foot level of this book, basically, Galatians is written about being free, about being free, freedom in Christ. But that liberty is threatened by two things, and we're going to go through this all month long, two things that seek to take away um, uh, our liberty. Number one was legalism. Legalism. Everybody say legalism. And number two was license. And we're going to be diving into that. Those two things, forces from without, legalism, and license from within that seek to destroy and take away the freedom that Christ has uh, gotten uh, through the cross and has given to us by his spirit. So Galatians 5.1, let's put it up on the screen. This is where we want to start this morning. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And we're going to talk about that this morning, but for freedom, Christ has set us free. And you heard the testimony of, of John Wilson in the, in the uh, bumper that led to this this morning. Christ has set him free. Christ has delivered him. Do you see what they were in the, in the uh, Celebrate Recovery? And, 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 you know, Celebrate Recovery is all about finding freedom. And if you take growth track, number two in our four steps of growth track is freedom that Christ has set us free. This is such a precious gift to us, so precarious, yet very precious. So we're going to walk through that this week. I'm going to start by reading Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and I want you to um, follow along with me as I read. Paul, an apostle sent from men, sent, sent not from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. Now, the churches in Galatia, where is that? What are we talking about? Okay, Galatia was north, in the Middle East, is north of Israel, and it's in what would be considered modern-day Turkey, all right? Modern-day Turkey. So these were the churches that he was uh, ministering to, that he helped start, um, that was part of his first missionary journey. And now he's getting back. He's about 18 months off of that first missionary journey, and he's discovering that some people had come in and right behind him, and they were his, the freedom that these people had in Christ was being threatened. And so he's writing this letter to them. So he writes to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from our God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6, I am astonished. See, he first of all kind of says, this was the message I brought to you. It was freedom through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But man, I'm not going to waste any more time on, hey, how you doing? How's the weather? How's Aunt Martha? You know, I remember when Brother Billy stubbed his toe. How's his toe? You know, how did, did George get that job? You know, he's not, he's not writing that kind of a letter. He's just jumping right in both feet. And he says in verse 6, I am astonished. Oh, man. Who oh, kind of got my attention. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion that forces from the outside and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, as we have already said. And so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be eternally condemned. Now, am I now trying to win approval of men or of God, or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of God. Christ. The liberty that they had in Christ was being threatened from the outside by legalism. And a little later on in the book, we find that it's inside by license. So let's first of all 
Paul says, I am astonished that you would so easily be persuaded into a different gospel. So what is the gospel that, that Paul preached to them? Well, the simplest answer to that, the gospel that Paul preached, he also wrote to the Ephesian church about it in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. This is the gospel that Paul preached. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Everybody say gift of God. Not as a result of works or trying to keep the law, lest any man should boast. Or as we like to use a, a, a definition of the word grace here at the Hill, comes from the book One Way Love. It says grace is the unconditional acceptance of an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. In other words, you didn't do anything to be saved. We took communion this morning. All the work that brought us salvation was done by Christ through his sacrifice on the cross, and as Paul said in his greeting, and through the one who God raised him from the dead. All we have to do is put our faith and believe and receive that. That's it. So why the emphasis? Well, first of all, the liberty that Paul is, says being threatened from the outside came from a group of people. See, Paul went through, they started the churches, he continued his first missionary journey, he comes back and he found out that there was a group of people that came in behind him. And they were a group of people who claimed to be Christians, but they also went by the name of Judaizers. These were people who were Jewish believers in Christ who said, yeah, yeah, we, we know that it comes through faith in Christ, but if you're really going to be saved, you have to put yourself under the law of Moses. You have to follow all of the laws of Moses and believe in Jesus. But how many of you know, Ephesians 2, 8 says, it's, by grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of works. It's no works. You don't have to keep any law. You have, Christ has redeemed us from the law. So not only did they want them to come in under the law once again and enter a legalistic relationship with God, if I keep this and do that, then God will receive me and, oh yeah, we'll throw in the blood of Jesus on there too just to make sure. Come on. And then all the men, they wanted the men to be circumcised because they're talking to Gentiles now. They want them to be circumcised. So not only were these people known as the Judaizers, but they also were known as the circumcision party. Now, i got to ask you a question. As, if a newborn could talk, a newborn boy could talk, I don't think he would say circumcision was any party. Come on, somebody. So I think that's one of the biggest oxymorons I've ever heard. The circumcision is not a party. But that's what they call themselves, so we're just going to leave that one alone. Perhaps I shouldn't even have mentioned that in church. I don't know. But it's in the Bible, so it's okay. So the Judaizers tried to bring them back under the law. When Paul had said, it is for freedom Christ has set you free. In Philippians 3.9, Paul writes, he says, I no longer count on my righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. And a few verses earlier, in Philippians 3.3, 3, he says, We Christians glory in what Christ Jesus has done for us and realize that we are helpless to save ourselves. Saved by grace, not by works, so no one can boast. Jesus be the center of it all. Nothing else matters. We sung it this morning. We are saved by grace. So I was thinking about that. So how many of us, as followers of Jesus, call yourself a Christian? You say, well, you know, that doesn't, you're talking about outward threats. You're talking about outward threats of legalism. Pastor, I don't, I don't keep the, 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 the laws of Moses. I don't, I don't do that. So how does this apply to me? Well, I began to think about that. And I began to think, and this may step on somebody's toes this morning, but I began to think about how legalistic Christians can become. 
Now, we'll, we'll go out and we'll evangelize and we'll tell people in the midst of all their mess that God loves you. God accepts you just the way you are. God wants you to come in, and, and he's just going to take you, and there's nothing you have to do. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And we, we, don't, we get this gift of righteousness. And all you need to do is step across the line of faith and ask Jesus into your heart, and you become a Christian. Man, Andrew Womack says that's the too good to be true news, but it's true. It is too good to be true. But then something happens. People come into the church, We get them in there for a little while, and we begin to look at their life. We begin to go and say, hey, man, what are you doing that for? Hey, what's going on in your life? Hey, don't you know that saved people don't act like that? Hey, come on. You need to clean it up a little bit. You need to do, and we start pointing out people's people's habits. We point to people that aren't making it. They're not coming along like we think they should. And so we begin to put the standard on them and say, hey, now this is the bar. You're in. You're in. But now we start putting a hammer down and saying, hey, man, you better do this. You better do that. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought I came into this. I thought you said it is by grace I was saved through faith. I thought you said that Jesus takes me just as I am. Well, maybe Jesus takes you just as you are, but sometimes the church has a struggle with the way you are. And you ever wonder why people leave the church? Sometimes it's because they're still trying to deal with their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups, yet people in the church are kind of making them feel that they're not worthy to be in the church. Ooh, it's quiet in here this morning. It is quiet in here, and I'm going to go a little bit further with that. Not only do we do that, but we'll, we'll be so quick to say, and you know, maybe you won't say it to their face, but you're going to say it to somebody. Hey, and, and here's how we do it. We say, uh, hey, we need to pray for old brother, sister, so-and-so. Because I sense they're really struggling in this area. Come on, somebody. Right? They got, they, got, we got, they got some sin in their life. But then have you ever noticed Holy Spirit will be talking to you? Talking about your sin? And it's, oh, wait a minute now, that's a whole different story. I got issues. I got issues. I'm working on my issues. And so, you know, I'm just, yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's part of my past, and I'm trying to get free from that. And, you know, sometimes I get up, some righteous man falls seven times, but, you know, the Lord raises him up. And I'm just going to say it. Sometimes we just justify our own behavior, which we know ain't right, but yet we don't offer the same grace to somebody else. I think Jesus talked about that. I think he said something about having a speck in someone else's eye and a log in your own eye. Come on, somebody. We get legalistic. So let me go a little bit further with that. So, pastor, what are you saying today? That we can just come into the church and we can just do whatever we want? No, I'm not saying that. Because the other side of legalism is license. The difference, I'm going to go a little deep with you this morning, hope you hang on. The difference is when we come to Christ, we need to come to the understanding first and foremost how much he loves us and how accepted we are. We need, we got to have a revelation of that. If you're going to make any progress, you got to know that Christ does accept you just the way you are. But when Holy Spirit enters your life, he's going to begin to do a process of transformation. And there's a big theological word for that. And that big theological word is called sanctification. And sanctification means that the world, imagine you, you had, to God you're like a piece of fine china. But you wouldn't let, you wouldn't let your dog, I, I don't know, maybe you would, but I wouldn't let my dog eat off of a, piece of fine china. I'm going to get him a dog dish. But the world's been feeding you some, some dog food, some, and you've been, you've been eating it. But now, God says, no, you're my, you're my, my workmanship. You're my craftsmanship. I want to treat you like fine china. When I feed you, I want you to eat the delicacies of heaven. 
I want you to grow in your wisdom and understanding. I want to nurture you along, favor with God and man. You see the difference? And so there is this process, yeah, where we do want to, Lord knows, we want to shed those hurts. We want to shed those habits. We want to shed those hang-ups. And it's called the process of sanctification. He takes us from one point to another point where we begin to understand our purpose. We begin to live out our destiny. We discover that he has a legacy that he wants to live through us. But it has to come through this process of God called me just as I was, but he's not going to leave me the way he found me. Come on, somebody. But it's his work in my life. So don't judge me along the way, but encourage me along the way. Help me along the way. And tell me what God would say. Use God's words over my life. Because I tell you what, you can, uh, you can attract, uh, what is it, bees to honey with honey and whatever that is. But anyway, just say something sweet to somebody. It's going to do a lot more than harsh words. Are you with me? Come on, somebody. That's how it works. But see, here's the other thing. The other side of that, Paul says, okay, so he goes on in his book and he, in, in this letter and he says, so the other side of legalism, if, if we, you know, we're not supposed to be judgmental toward one another. So then we kind of get to this idea where we say, well, then I can, I can just do whatever I want. I can just do whatever I want. But Paul says, no, no. The other side of, of, uh, the, that, that threats your free, threatens your freedom in Christ, the outward is legalism, but the inward is saying, well, I got issues. I, you know, I can get, I can kind of get away with this because I know that the grace of Christ, I'm already forgiven pastor said that from the pulpit you know so if legalism is the pendulum swinging one way too far license takes us too far in the other direction here's what paul says in galatians 5 13 through 15 he says you brothers were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature rather serve one another in love the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. For if you keep biting on each other and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed. Instead of pointing out each other's flaws and then allowing ourselves to you know, go our own way, we are, supposed to be, we are supposed to be free in Christ. And the only law that we are to fulfill is the law of love. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, Christ has set us free from sin. He has set us free from self. And now we have been given the privilege to live as a follower of Jesus. Galatians 5, 16 uh, through 18. Let me, let, let, let's read that. It goes on a little bit further. Paul says this, chapter 5. So I say then... Don't live, by the, don't live by the sinful nature. I say live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit you are no longer under the law. You're not under the law of Moses. You're not under the law of sinful nature. But you are free indeed. You are free to live out your purpose. Your purpose is to become love, to become the love of God to others on this planet. The gospel that we preach is the gospel that is found in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything that you have need of, he will provide. So once we are free and we, be, we, we begin to discover that we can, we can live a, a life of love, God... He will provide everything that we need. And one of the things that God provides us is peace. He provides us shalom. In fact, what was broken in the garden was restored on the cross. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ now, he gives us entrance into his kingdom. And, and what he gives us is peace and freedom. God is the originator of the peace and freedom party. Come on, somebody. I find peace with God. I find that, I, 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 like I said, I can't overemphasize. I find this grace, this acceptance, 
that I'm really truly free, that, 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 that no longer, as we said this morning, no longer, he's cleansed my conscience. Paul said, I can sleep at night. I, I, have, I no longer have a guilty conscience. I find peace with, with not only uh, God, but I find peace with myself. You know, there's so much in this world that causes us consternation and, and disrupts our peace. But in peace, in, in Christ, we find our peace. We find our peace because the, our past is in the past. The present is now and the future is before us. My shame is gone. And so often I find that when I, I find that I'm forgiven and I'm loved and, and God takes away my shame, no longer do I have that pain that would cause me to, to gratify the, the needs of the flesh because the flesh does not like pain. When, when I've lost my peace, I, I, inner peace, I, I want to do anything to just kind of make it go away. But guess what? When we understand that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, there's a peace that surpasses our own human understanding that floods our soul and we're free from shame. And our past is behind us. The future is before us. I've been given, the Bible says in Jeremiah, a future and a hope. And I have peace with others. I have peace with others. God can actually heal our relationships. So when I, when I come to Christ, the freedom that he gives, he gives us freedom to be free to reconcile with God reconcile our inner issues from our past and reconcile relationships all around us. And that last one, that last one can be difficult, especially in, in this day and age. And I read a, quote, read a quote by Bob Goff this week, and this is what I love he said. It has to do with don't gratify the sinful nature, but just fulfill the law of Christ. Love your neighbor. This is what Bob Goff said. He said, loving people we don't understand or agree with is just the kind of beautiful, counterintuitive, risky stuff who people who are risky stuff that people who are becoming love do. It's being free enough just to risk loving somebody who disagrees with you. To have that attitude that just says, I'm just gonna love you anyway. This gospel, Paul says that we are free. We have peace with God, but God also gives us his provision. Do You know, one thing, I know we don't really talk too much these days in age about kings and, and kingdoms, but one of the things that, that a king was responsible for, for people living in his kingdom, one was protection and the other was provision. And God said, I will provide all of your needs through Christ Jesus according to my riches in glory. That's Philippians 4.19. So what does that mean? It means that God pours out on me everything that I need through his grace. The Bible says, husbands, you can, you can love your wives like Christ loved the church. Inside of me, I can't do that. But with the provision of the king in his kingdom through the gospel that he has given to us, I can do that. When the doctor diagnosis is just disaster, I know that I have a God who said he would provide healing, that by his stripes I am healed. Just a couple of weeks ago, I got a, I got a, uh, a text message from one of our members to pray for a relative who was in Southern California, a young woman who was suffering liver failure. She had been ill, and the doctors couldn't find out what was going on. And by the time they found out what was going on in her body, her liver had totally shut down. And she was on, a, a, on life support waiting for a, a liver transplant. They said, this is what she's going to need. And so, man, I mean, this thing went out and people began to pray. People began to intercede for her, just say, God, would you heal her? And so we got another text that said, good news, a liver has been found, a, donate, a donor, and they're going to put it in. And they went and they were gonna, about ready to put the liver in her and they discovered that the liver was damaged. And they said, they can't, they can't use that liver. And so what they were going to do, they kind of felt like hope was being lost. She wasn't, she wasn't getting any stronger. She was growing weaker. People began to pray, began to believe that Jesus is our healer, that God, you can do anything if we ask and believe in faith that you can do this. And do you know that within 24 hours after that, 
she began to, she began to wake up. Uh, her husband went into the room and she recognized him. Though she couldn't speak, she was able to squeeze his hand. Uh, the, the doctors were astonished. And then next day she was sitting up. The next day she was talking. The next day she was eating. The next day she was sitting in a chair, fully in, in, in have her faculties about her. And the doctors have no explanation for it. She went from death's door without hope, no liver transplant, to her, somehow it reversed. Well, we know how it reversed. Because through prayer, God's provision, He can do anything. So we ask and we receive. In His kingdom, He tells me to give, to give. And when I give, what does he say? He gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. See? That's the freedom that we have. That's the freedom that we have in Christ. We can live a life without limits. But let's stay free from legalism and let's stay free from thinking that we can just do our own thing. Instead, let's live in the power of the Spirit. This morning I've, I've asked David to come and I just want you just to prepare your hearts as we get ready to pray and end the service. But I just want to sing chorus that we sang a little bit earlier and let Holy Spirit just speak to your heart today. I, I, it's funny, you know, when I, when I preach, people come up to me afterward and say, Pastor, I loved it when you said this. And I go, I never said that. See, because as I speak, Holy Spirit's speaking to you. So let's sing and let's wrap this in prayer. Jesus, I'm the center of it all. Jesus, I'm the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, oh, Jesus, Jesus, nothing else matters, nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you, Jesus. You, oh Jesus, Jesus. So I'm gonna ask you, would you stand with me this morning? So as we conclude this one question comes into my mind so where do we start with this in Galatians 2 20 says for I've been crucified with Christ it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me can we put that on the screen and the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me this morning when we took communion we were identifying we were identifying with the crucified and risen Christ Maybe this morning you haven't done that. And here's the key. What you need to do is just step across that line of faith and say, Jesus, I identify with that. I, I give you my life. You gave your life for me. And now the life that I live, I want to live. Even though it's in this flesh, I don't want to live according to the flesh. I want you to fill me with your spirit. I don't want to live my life by faith. I want you to be my king. I want to be part of your kingdom. You are my righteousness. You are my provider. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. And God, for the peace, I pray that you would give today without measure. I pray, God, that you would heal our hearts of hurts, of shame, 
God, that we wouldn't be uh, retaliating or seeking revenge any longer, living by the laws of, uh, of this world that, that seek that if I've been hurt, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, I want revenge. God, instead, that we would see how much we've been forgiven and you've given us the capacity to have peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with one another. That you can make us to be who you dreamed us to be, those who are going to love their neighbor as themselves. So, Father, this morning, I pray that over us. I pray that, that God, as we, some that are beginning their journey with you, God, as they step across that line of faith, Father, this morning, that they would find this, this burden lifted. They would find that you can be the center of life. God, they're not crazy. It's not fanatical. It's what we were created to do and who we were created to be. To be disciples, to be followers, to be ambassadors. to be your representatives loving this earth. Help us to love well as we've been loved. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Let's give God praise this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah.